my presentation now, I'm gonna focus on something very specific, which is monitoring treatment of liver metastasis with one of those two methods that Peter uh, showed earlier, and that is the bolus injection. The majority of what I'm showing here this afternoon, it comes out of this paper that was published in UMB last year, which was titled Quantification of Tumor Microvascularity with Respiratory Gated Contrast Enhanced Ultrasound for Monitoring Therapy. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna mostly present the results of this work, and then also have some additions here and there that those were uh, the latest developments since the last year. Here is an outline of this presentation, a quick introduction and motivation, state the objective, materials and methods. And I'm gonna have a little bit about indicator dilution theory that also Peter uh, did a great job presenting. Talk about respiratory gating, which is yet another way of uh, treating motion. Then show you our therapy monitoring results. And finally show you some additional results in terms of reproducibility. So here is my motivation slide. It starts with these two black pictures. It take the case where we have somebody with a colorectal metastasis and he's going to go through chemotherapy every two to three weeks for a total of six or more doses. So this is how that metastasis is looking on day one before any therapy. This metastasis is hyperechoic, highly arterialized in the, in the arterial phase and then it will turn into a black hole in the late phase. Now, um, a few uh, sessions down um, the chemotherapy. We do the same thing and we take a look at this picture. Now, first observation, if you remember from my lecture yesterday, the gain here wasn't the same between the two. The, the, the gain on the, sec on the right, it was a little bit lower, hence it was a darker and less bright image. Now, the lesion seems to behave generally the same way, except it's slightly different in size. However, it's not exactly the same plane, et cetera, et cetera. So somebody has to evaluate how this patient is doing, and you can't do it visually. We need a metric to quantify the progress of antiangiogenesis therapy. So here is our objective, just like what was stated in the two previous presentations, actually is to evaluate the response of colorectal liver metastasis to cytotoxic and antiangiogenic treatment with contrast-enhanced ultrasound. So we want to measure the flow down to the capillary level, to the microcirculation, and see what changes are being caused. Now, I'm embarrassed to show you my materials and methods after you have just seen trials with 400 patients, 800 patients, etc. So I only have seven patients in this study. I guess my excuse is that I come from a very small country, and so I scale the patients according to my country. Actually, I will try to explain why we only have seven patients as we go by. So this is as may, perhaps a pilot study, a first step, where we want to look something very specific and in a very well-contained uh, matter. So every, every one of these patients is going to get six or more therapy sessions every 21 days, and we're going to observe them with ultrasound exam before each session. So in total, we're going to have well above 100 injections to analyze. So it's, it's not really that minor task to follow seven patients that they are undergoing a very strict protocol. However, it's a much, much bigger task what the previous presented, presenter showed us with 800 patients. Now, we do CT and MR every session three and six just to apply the RESIS criteria. We also did a reproducibility study, which at the time of the publication of the paper, it was just five patients, and the, the intention was to confirm that if you have patients that are not taking any therapy and you're measuring something, that something is not changing from time to time. Later on, I'm gonna show you that we have added a few more patients to this reproducibility study, and I'll show you our trends. In we used an IU22 Philips uh, scanner with a C52 curved linear array, and we collected, as I said before, two-minute loops. We used nonlinear pulsing schemes, of course, the scheme uh, that we used was power modulation and side contrast side by side. 
We used originally QLab, Philip, the Philips uh, quantification package to extract the time intensity curves, which by the way, very importantly, as pointed out by the, both of the previous two presenters, we used linear data, not logarithmically compressed image data. And then eventually we went on to the MATLAB uh, software package for care feeding. So this is what we would do. Here is a peak of the arterial phase. This is the lesion we are surveying. This is the late portal phase. We use information from both phases to choose our region of interest. And we form a time intensity curve, the yellow time intensity curve you see here. We also play a, a region of interest somewhere in the normal um, liver parenchyma, if there is such a thing as a normal liver parenchyma in a patient who has metastasis. And we also form a time intensity curve from that re second region of interest. Now I'm gonna divert a little bit and I'm gonna say a few more words about indicator dilution. Because what I'm alluding to is that these time intensity curves and the curve feeding models that we're going to use are actually coming from uh, basic principles from indicator dilution theory. So we inject or infuse an indicator. In our case, the indicator is a tracer and our tracer is microbubbles. And we watch this indicator as after we inject it into the IV side, we watch how this delta function or ramp function here is spreading in time after it goes through the heart, the lungs, and finally arrives at the organ of interest. This has been used extensively in pharmacology for hundreds of years. One of my favorite uh, references that does a great job of explaining this uh, um, these theories is a paper by Ziedler from 2000, but there are papers that they date back to 1829, to give you an idea. The important parameters here is the velocity, the flow, and the volume. So wh what we wanna do in ultrasound is adapt these theories for ultrasound contrast agents and try to extract important hemodynamic parameters. As I said before, I'm going to only talk about bolus injection because this is the protocol we applied for this study. Now, uh, here is a time intensity curve. You've seen it repeatedly this afternoon from the others two intensity versus time. Uh, the red dots is the raw data. The straight line is a fitted line, which we will see in a second what it is. Important parameters are the area under the curve in blue, the time to peak, which is the time from here to here, the peak intensity, the washing time, sometimes I will be using in this work, which is a time from five to 95% of the intensity, and the mean transit time, which is this point right here, which is the first moment of this curve. If we have an, an indicator of uh, denoted as X, the amount of indicator in a region of interest is given by this integral here, which is the flow times the, in, the integral of the concentration of the time with respect to time, which is the area under the curve here. Now an important relationship, which was also indicated earlier, is that the volume is related to the flow with the, with the mean transit time through this relationship here, and this is how we calculate the mean transit time. All of this is good, except that in ultrasound, we don't really measure concentration, we're measuring image intensity. But we have done previous work uh, in my group to show that the image intensity you get from nonlinear pulsing schemes is proportional, linearly proportional to the agent concentration. So for all practical purposes, we can replace C, we can replace C with image intensity and these relationships apply. Now there are various models that they can be used for indicator dilution. And we also did a review from my group that was uh, published last year that describes five or six of these models. In the present work, uh, actually today, I'm gonna only talk about the log normal model, even though we only use an empirical model as we, as we will see in a second. So we know that the microbubbles, they go through a region of interest at different times because they are, uh, they are going through these different kind of vessels. There is Brownian motion, there is laminar flow, or there is turbulence. Time intensity curve is interpreted as the probability density function of the transit times in this region of interest. And it really tells us the amount of indicator particles that they go through this region of interest every time interval. So for a network of vessels, just like we have in tumors, 
with large number of generations, the flow distribution very often can be described with stated there. Now, the beauty of this is that we can actually extract from this feeded curve the mean transit time and the time to peak with closed form uh, expressions, and it will be a lot easier to apply this to our data. To have an idea whether this would actually work in vivo, first we tried to see how well this would work in vitro. So we have a system here with a flow fandom. This is a single tube flow fandom, but we also repeated the work with a cartridge, dia with a dialysis cartridge, which kind of looks like a, a, a vascular bed with capillaries, and we found very similar results. To look a little closer into our setup, our setup looks like this. Here is our flow fandom. This is a, there is a mixing chamber so that as the injection comes in, gets mixed in the mixing chamber, and it goes with the velocity that's defined by the peristaltic pump. This is our fandom. This is our mixing chamber. And then we observe with the probe the agent that's arriving in our region of interest. So this is a contrast side-by-side -side image. This is the flow, um, the, the, the flow vessel. But just like I said, the same thing applies with a group of micro vessels. And it's a six millimeters diameter vessel. And we want to form these time intensity curves. So if I play this loop, you can see the arrival of the bolas, and we're going from very low to the peak of the bolas and washing out. So this is how you form these time intensity curves, is the variation of the intensity in a region of interest as a function of time. So for a flow rate of 25 ml <clears throat> per minute, we get this time intensity curve from the setup I showed you. And if I increase the flow rate, the whole time intensity curve gets squashed. And if I increase it more, it even gets, becomes smaller. So what's really is happening, this relationship here, it's telling us that as we are increasing the flow rate, the mean transit time is decreased. And if, and if we look at this plot here, which is the mean transit time as a function of flow rate, for a variety of flow rates, we can see that there is one overall relationship, inverse proportionality, which is what really this relationship predicted. The same thing applies for the area under the curve. Here is the one overall relationship, where else the peak intensity follows pretty much a straight line here. So what the take home message here is, is that we can actually take something like this because it's, it's to a certain degree resembles what is happening in our case. And we can take that uh, log normal model and apply it to extract important parameters. Now, the work we published though, we didn't use the log normal model, but we're actually now planning to repeat that work. On that work, we made the hypothesis that the important parameter was going to be the washing time or the, the time it takes from zero to the maximum. And we use this empirical relationship that describes how quickly something is perfusing. So if you have a low T here, then this results in a very fast um, rise time. And a, as that number is increasing, it goes into a slower rise time. We want to fit the data so that it will be easier to, to remove the noise and extract some parameters. Now, to also further normalize, we decided to normalize the washing time of the lesion with respect to the washing time of the normal parenchyma. So this WITR is how fast the tumor is feeling compared to the rest of the liver. So if there was no tumor, then WITR would be equal to 1. Major problem, just like uh, the previous presenters uh, explained, is motion. So our approach was, instead of dealing with motion correction algorithms, which is also a great idea, it was to do something about respiratory motion and, in fact, do respiratory gating. So what we did is we draw a region of interest around the diaphragm, and we can watch as the diaphragm goes in and out of the region of interest, we can form that time intensity curve, and then we remove every frame where the diaphragm was outside that region of interest. So if I play this loop here now, you can get is the time intensity curve of, uh, of, the, of the diaphragm. In yellow is the time intensity curve of my lesion. And in blue is the time intensity curve of, 
uh, the normal parenchyma. If I remove all of those frames and I play the loop now, you can see that this tiny little lesion is actually staying the whole time into my view, and the time intensity curves, they are much better, much better or more well behaved. This is the original time intensity curve from yellow, and this is a time intensity curve that's respiratory gated. And notice, it's not just noise and the average would turn out to be the same, because if I did a best line curve fit in this data, <coughs> it's definitely not the same one as the one after you do the respiratory gating. So to further explain this, and I'm gonna also do a demonstration with QLab here, I draw a region of interest now on the fundamental side. So on the fundamental side, there's go not going to be a lot of variation. And I form the time intensity curve as you see here. So all of this is the breathing. So now I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna say I'm gonna leave only 30% of this data here and everything else will be eliminated. And that's what I do next, which means every time the diaphragm is moving out, I erase the frames. And after I do that, I get these time intensity curves that they are much, be much better than the original ones. I can do curve feeding. And I actually believe that nature probably with time intensity curves behaves more like this <coughs> and not like certain noisy curves we see where sometimes there are corners and these discontinuities, etc. I cannot imagine of a vessel all of a sudden stopping and starting again. So now, if I may, I'm gonna do a demonstration in QLab that shows how this is being applied. So you can see how simple it is to do this respiratory gating. So I take this loop here, and instead of letting it play slowly, I'm gonna play it myself and show you that there is a lesion in here, and there is a lot of motion because of breathing. So I go now, I'm going to erase whatever I had before and create it again. So this is my loop, and I'm just going to draw a region of interest around the diaphragm. And now what you see in this time intensity curve that's being created, there is some sort of a sinusoidal motion, which is the breathing of the patient. So I'm gonna wait until this goes through. And after this is done, then I decide how much of this uh, sinusoidal loop I wanna keep in. So 10%, 30%, 50%, and that really defines how much motion I'm gonna allow in. So I have an experimental version of QLab here that does this automatically. So now I'm gonna call for only 30% of these peaks. So automatically 30% is retained, everything else is thrown away. So you see now this loop, the liver is not really moving much like before. And now I'm gonna carry on with the presentation. So now I'm gonna show you the results of that trial. First, I'm gonna talk about the original reproducibility study, which was just five patients, and then I'm gonna show you about the extended, extended reproducibility study. So for these five patients, we did multiple injections, and we measured the lesion washing time. This is a deviation from the mean, from, uh, from the mean of the number of injections that we had. Then for normal parenchyma, and I formed the WITR, or the washing time ratio, and this is a deviation, the percent deviation from the mean of every one of them. So you see that the deviation from the mean, it's on an average is 9%, and it's as little as 4%, and it's as high as 16%. So in this slide, what I'm doing here, I'm trying to convince you that when no changes are taking place, I do not observe much change, or my zero point is actually the 10% uh, variation. Now, these are some of our results for therapy monitoring. These are different patients before the therapy, in the middle of the therapy, and at the end of the therapy, and this is for the lesion, and this is for the normal parenchyma. So you can see that before the therapy, we normal parenchyma, but the important thing is that if there are changes from injection to injection, or if there are changes in the patient's cardiac output, all of those are being normalized because what I'm forming is the ratio of these two time scales here, is the ratio of this with respect to this. So 
we are proposing this WITR as an imaging biomarker, and I, and I remind you, is the lesion washing time divided by the normal parenchyma washing time. And if we take, for example, two patients, a good responder and a bad responder, the good responder starts away from a value of one because the lesion is filling a lot faster than normal parenchyma. And as time goes by, the good responder approaches one, where else the bad responder starts away from one and stays away from one. It doesn't approach, this line doesn't approach one. This summarizes the seven patients we did. So for, these are just different code names, so we don't reveal the identities. This is what we saw during, after the first therapy. This is the overall result, and this is conventional evaluation. By conventional evaluation, I mean resist criteria. So we can see that in four out of five patients responding to therapy, we were able to predict after the first dose and in six out of the six patients responding, by the end of the therapy, we correctly predicted them with the WITR. So that was what was really published in the 2010 paper. Now we are carrying on with the reproducibility study, but instead of just looking at the washing time only and making certain hypotheses, we're looking at all parameters. At the present time, we have 12 patients, some of them, they have malignant. Some of them, they have benign lesions. The point is that those lesions are not changing from one injection to the next. And we're doing anywhere from two to four injections. And since we are really doing respiratory gating, we are considering both inhalation and exhalation. So it's almost like doubling the amount of injections we have. And actually, a side point here is that Peter said that we can only do one plane only with a bolus injection. Actually, if we consider respiratory gating, we can do multiple planes depending where we tune, where we trigger uh, from the respiratory cycle. So up to now, we have roughly 60 time intensity curves. And now we do the same thing I showed you before. So we place the lesion in the early arterial and in the late portal. But now we don't just feed up to the peak. We feed from the peak to the end and here is a tumor time intensity curve, and here is a normal parenchyma. And uh, this point here may very well be from recirculation, and maybe we want to stop our curve feeding at that point there. This is just the various time intensity curve we get from different patients, from tumor, and from parenchyma. So the first observation that we can make is that if we do our job right, and the loop is correct, and there hasn't been too much motion, we always get these nice, smooth curves. So one of the biggest problems we're having, really, in terms of quantifying angiogenesis is that it's extremely difficult to have a good loop so we can later on send on for quantification. But as I said before, I'm a firm believer that nature, it doesn't have kinks in the curve, or sometimes it does have kinks in the curve, but these specific curves, they are not meant to be noisy and having kinks and changing direction here and there. So here is our reproducibility result. So from these curves, we, we try to evaluate all parameters. So the WITR, washing time of the lesion, mean transit time, area under the curve, peak intensity, for the lesion and for the parenchyma. So in red, I have the time parameters. In blue, I have the amplitude parameters. This line here is the average standard error, which is the average of the standard deviation by the mean divided by the square root of n. And this is the coefficient of variation, which doesn't divide by the square root of the n, which was similar as to what Peter was showing in his presentation. So we see that our time parameters, they are roughly, they have a coefficient of variation of roughly 20%, where the area under the curve and the peak intensity, they have variations in the order of 40 to 50%. Now, if I don't apply respiratory gating, the coefficient of variation increases considerably from when I do apply respiratory gating. So the take-home message here is that at the present, with this much data uh, up to now, we have 20% coefficient of variation in time parameters and 40% in, in amplitude parameters. We are using now the log normal model 
and respiratory gating together. If respiratory gating is not used, these numbers are considerably worse. Intensity parameters are more prone to errors. I'm not suggesting that intensity parameters like peak intensity and area under the curve are not useful parameters. Indeed, there are extremely useful parameters. But those are the parameters that is more likely the user can make adjustments and they will be affected. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, use of high dynamic range, uh, high compression is always advised even at the expense of compromised aesthetics. So in closing here, I'm proposing a method for tumor angiogenesis quantification with bolus injection of ultrasound <coughs> contrast agents. Respiratory gating addresses motion problems. It's very simple to be implemented, and it makes life a lot easier in terms of quantification. The ratio of lesion to normal parenchyma washing time, or WITR, was found in this small number of patients to be a good imaging biomarker indicative of early tumor response. WITR is able to predict response to therapy as early as the first treatment and definitely a lot more future work with larger number of patients is needed and will follow and we are currently performing. Um, thank you for your attention.